Well, good morning once again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Melissa Klabe. I'm the Director of Education for Alzheimer's Orange County. And welcome to our mini caregiver conference. Uh, we had originally planned to have this in person, but of course, COVID had other plans. Um, so we decided that we wanted to do something. So we put together a sort of mini virtual conference. And we really, really hope that you find it helpful today. You find some helpful tips and strategies and encouragement as caregivers. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have any issues, any technical issues, you can type in questions in the question box at any time, um, as well as questions for our speakers. We won't have a whole lot of Q&A today. We have kind of a tightly packed schedule, um, but feel free to type any questions and we will reach out to you if we don't address them um, during the live presentation. And uh, this will be available to watch afterward. We are recording it and it will be available on our YouTube page in about a week. And that information is in the chat and it will be emailed to you as well. And again, if you have any questions, please type them in. You can also email learn, L-E-A-R-N, at A-L-Z-O-C dot org at any time. If you have any questions, that goes to me. Um, we have three speakers today, which I'll introduce as they go. Um, but first, I want to thank our sponsors for helping make today possible. Our premier sponsor, Active Care, is a provider of personalized memory care, and they enhance quality of life for their residents and families. And they've been serving California since 1988. So we're very thankful for their sponsorship. We also are sponsored today by Arbor Palms of Anaheim, which is assisted living and memory care, senior helpers, in-home senior assistant services, and special thanks to Family Caregiver Resource Center and the Archstone Foundation for supporting our work and Council on Aging for a generous donation for our giveaway. So anyone that's attending today will be um, uh, we invited to attend our swing by next week and you'll have more information about that there's actually a flyer in your handouts about it, and I will email that information to you. Uh, we would love for you to drive by our office in Irvine and pick up a goodie bag from our sponsors and a caregiver uh, resource binder. Um, it's filled with tons of information, really, really helpful, and it was a really nice donation. And so we would love to, to say hi and thank you for joining us today and for you to pick that up. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can type it in the question box. Again, hopefully the flyer answers most of those questions for you. Um, so today we are going to begin our conference here with some strategies for becoming a more resilient caregiver. And our first speaker is Dr. Miriam Galindo. If you're a part of our Alzheimer's OC family, you should be familiar with her. Um, she does lots of education for us. Um, her and I do Facebook live events once a month. She does classes for us. She's a licensed psychologist, social worker, and registered nurse uh, with over 30 years of experience in a variety of outpatient and inpatient health settings. She has a doctorate in psychology, a master's in social work, and she's completing a, a graduate degree in nursing. So she's got lots of, of great knowledge to share with us. Um, she's also a former longtime caregiver for her late father, Henry, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And she's been with us for many, many years. So because time is so tight, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Glindo, and I'm going to um, have you share your screen here. Give me a quick second. Okay, so you should be able to show your slides now. If you can pull those up, perfect. All right, and Dr. Glindo, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, and um, Melissa, you might wanna minimize my screen if that's possible. Yeah, you're all good. Everyone can see your slides nice and big and they see you, so. Perfect, okay. So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Melissa, for introducing me. And what a great day it is. I can't tell you how happy I am to be able to present this information, not only because I think it's there's such a need, but I've been there. <laughs> um, and I know that I was looking for resiliency strategies for myself because the journey is quite a journey, as you know. And um, so we're gonna go through those uh, strategies for becoming more resilient. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is this, caregiving for a loved one with dementia can be filled with joy, as you know, but it can also have its challenges. And there are two reasons for this, these challenges. One is, uh, unlike any other form of caregiving, 
caring for somebody with dementia requires sustained vigilance, meaning you're always on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're thinking 20 steps ahead for someone who is depending on you for their health and safety. And as their um, needs are getting greater, your requirement to be 20 steps ahead is getting greater. Um, second, that disease is marked by a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. There's no clear cause, there's no cure, there's no predictable uh, progression. One day something works, the next day it doesn't. And you and I both know um, that we humans like to have a sense of predictability and order. Our brains strive toward control and understanding our universe. So when we're met with uncertainty and ambiguity, it can lead to chronic stress. And the problem with that is it can also create disease. Um, left unchecked, it can create emotional and physical disease. So our goal today is to help you become a more resilient caregiver. So let's start with a de definition of terms. What is resiliency? Well, resiliency means there are gonna be challenges, there are gonna be adversities, but you are not gonna break under pressure. You are gonna emerge stronger and healthier despite it and maybe even because of it. You're going to be a stronger person for it. So here's the good news. There are some things you can do to enhance resiliency. It's not just a matter of somebody's built a certain way or somebody was born to be more resilient. There are actually things you can do and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So what this presentation will cover are uh, six strategies, all that begin with the letter P, um, so they're easy to remember. And those six Ps that increase resilience are positivity, practicing the feeling, playing music, addressing your own physical health, finding meaning and purpose, and then recruiting a team or a posse. So let's start with a quick overview of the stress response. When your brain is subjected to a perceived threat, it responds by triggering a cascade of stress hormones and chemicals throughout your body. And you've probably heard of a lot of these stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. Those hormones flood your body and prompt your body to either flee or fight, and you've heard of this phenomenon, the fight or flight response. Well, in the short term, this is great. This is life-saving because those stress hormones can trigger your body to either run or fight and, um, and propel you into action, even beyond your thinking mind. Uh, you, can, you do this automatically. But over the long term, the problem is when these stress hormones are circulating throughout your body, they're uh, constricting your blood vessels, they're increasing your heart rate, um, they're shutting down blood flow to organs that are less necessary for that flight fight phenomenon. And over time, it creates an inflammatory response. It uh, leads to eventual disease. Um, both in the mind and body. And some of those diseases include anxiety, depression, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep disruptions, suppressed immunity, even some forms of cancer. So this is a real phenomenon and it's very, very important that we get a handle on this, especially as uh, caregivers for dementia. So here we go. Since we can't control the circumstances, we are going to learn how to control our response to the circumstances. And here are the six Ps for doing so. So let's jump in. First strategy, positivity. So you're probably asking yourself, what's so positive about dementia? I can't think of one thing. Well, truly, listen, we all go through the stages of grief and I've been there. Um, you know, it's one thing to be working professionally with somebody with dementia. It's quite another when your loved one um, is, you know, degenerating before your eyes. And what I've found and what you're probably finding too, 
is that you're grieving day to day. And so as you're coming to terms with this diagnosis, you're going through the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And they go back and forth. Just when you think you've reached acceptance, the next day it goes right back to sadness, right? So there's no right way. We've all been here together. I just want to encourage you, you're not alone in this and some days are gonna be more challenging than others. So we know we can't change the circumstances, but we can change our perception of the circumstances. And that's where positivity comes in. The reality of life is that it's your perceptions, right or wrong, that influence everything you do. It's not the circumstances, it's how you see them. So when you get a proper perspective, you might be very surprised at how things just fall into place. So two ways to get a proper perspective. Number one, adjust your vision. And by that, I mean this. You're gonna have this previous goal that you've established for yourself all your life. And it amounts to task accomplishment and productivity. How much can I get done in one day? And part of the grief is the things you used to be able to do, you can't do now. So the adjusting the vision means set a new standard for yourself, and that is quality over quantity. Quality meaning increased joy and minimization of pain and fear. If you accomplish that and your loved one is wearing three layers of clothes, you can pat yourself on the back and say, I accomplished what I set out to accomplish, which is more joy than not and an elimination of pain and fear. The second step toward positivity is realistic optimism. So you notice I put in the word realistic. It's not just denial. It's not that I'm just gonna put on a positive face. It's that you see things for what they are, but you're gonna search and find that positive um, silver lining in the cloud. So how do you do that? You strive toward a place of acceptance. You may not be at acceptance yet, but you're you're trudging toward it, you're marching toward it. You see the challenges, you get informed. The most helpful thing you could do is get as much information as possible because information will give you that sense of confidence, it'll give you some optimism, and you feel energized and motivated to do what you need to do. And the last thing with respect to positivity, positivity is catch the words you're saying to yourself. How many times do we say to ourselves things like, but, or yeah, but, or yeah, I have to, or such is life, or things that actually create the black cloud that we want to escape, right? So catch the words you're saying to yourself because changing just a few words may mean the difference to positivity in your day. So here's the second strategy and it's along the same lines. So I'm gonna ask you a question that you can answer for yourself. Does happiness make you smile or is it the other way around that smiling will make you happy? Well, if we're looking at our circumstances, we might say to ourselves, now you have to have happy circumstances and then I'll feel better. But the research actually says no. Smiling or going through the motions of you know, what happy people do will actually make you feel happier. It will trick the brain into believing it's happy. So the studies that were done involved people who were asked to smile in a mirror for you know 30 seconds a morning to see if that would actually change their feelings. And indeed it did. Just smiling in a mirror made people feel happier. You don't even have to feel good about it. You prop your, the corners of your mouth up and the, you know your brain will do the rest. The other thing that's helpful is seeing somebody else smile. Your brain apparently doesn't know the difference between a fake smile and a real smile and somebody else's smile and your smile. It will generate the same response, which is happy feelings. And you can do it another way too. You can laugh. We're gonna have somebody, an expert on laughter later on today, but you can do it in your own home too. And that would be just, you know, the movies that you're watching. You may want to um, replace one of your World War II movies with something that's funny, just, just to test this theory. 
because what the research says is that laughter in and of itself will do these things. It'll lower your blood pressure, it'll decrease your heart rate, it'll decrease the salivary concentration of st stress hormones, so it's real phenomenon, and it increases a chemi chemical that's a feel-good chemical. So remember I told you all of these things take place when you're under chronic stress. Your blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up, uh, stress hormones go up, the feel-good hormones go down. Laughter in and of itself can actually improve that measurably. So I'm gonna reiterate this because it's very, very important. Depression weakens the immune system. It exacerbates all those stress hormones. Laughter releases endorphins, those feel-good hormones. It will boost your immune resistance. It will decrease your heart rate and blood pressure. It even fosters brain connectivity. So all those problems that seemed impossible to solve, once you're laughing about it, suddenly your brain is connecting. And those of you who've done this know what I'm talking about. Suddenly you can think outside of the box Either the problems aren't that big a deal, or you actually come up with a solution. So it actually makes you smarter too. I'm gonna to promote that. All right, so now the third strategy, and this is by far one of my favorites, music. So research actually points out that music, especially music that is relaxing and is calming, and especially classical music reduces that stress response. And it's not just in your mind. This is actual measurable response. It'll stop that flight fight response and re replace it with a relaxed response. So what music does, and I'm just gonna talk about classical music here because the studies show that 25 minutes of classical music a day will do these things lower the cortisol levels, and remember that's a stress hormone. It'll trigger the release of dopamine, which is a feel-good brain chemical and hormone in your body. It'll alter brainwave activity, making problem solving more possible. It reduces anxiety up to 65%. It lowers blood pressure, reduces your heart rate, and reduces pain. So this is something you can actually do on your own. You can get it for free, classical radio station, or you can pop in a CD on your own, or you can sit down at your piano and you can bang out your own tunes. But the exposure to classical music actually is uh, stress relieving and it'll protect your body and your mind. Here's the bonus to music, and this is why I'm so excited about it. For loved ones with dementia, the research shows that even as your loved one's brain is degenerating, for some mysterious reason, and I would say it's a miracle, the part of the brain that preserves familiar music, that remembers that familiar music, is spared. Is that incredible? So MRI studies actually show minimal cortical atrophy in these areas, and minimal disruption of glucose metabolism. These music centers in the brain are spared, which means that when you're listening to your music and it's calming you, guess what? It's also calming your loved one. There are studies that show measurable reductions in agitation and anxiety with your loved one who is struggling with dementia. And that picture at the bottom is my beautiful dad, enjoying his music um, and so you can see how much i really appreciated music so now we get to the fourth strategy and that is physical health um, so i'm hesitating here because i know full well that the last thing we think about when we're taking care of somebody we love is ourselves right so you might be finding that as your loved one's world is narrowing and getting more and smaller and smaller so is yours and as a you know a crisis happens one morning you end up canceling your dental appointment you end up postponing your medical appointment you skip your walk you skip going to the grocery store you start eating out of whatever bag is available but what i'm going to implore you to do is 
make sure you're paying attention to that because if you're noticing over time you're you're skipping your appointments you're eating less fruits and vegetables drinking less water those are warning signals on your dashboard that you have to pay attention to that means your physical health is under stress so here is some uh, important facts to keep in mind and these are research-based um, in order to reduce stress and stay healthy it's important that you drink plenty of water every day why is that because 60 percent of our bodies are made up of water so just as you need to keep oil and gas in your tank it's really important that you consciously notice your water intake some people will say well what kind of water does it need to be alkalinized water does it need to be spring water actually the research would say tap water i know it's it surprises me too but it it's just getting that water into your body getting clean fresh water into your body the second thing to keep in mind is fruits and vegetables are very very important they contain antioxidants like vitamin a c and e that reduce inflammation and provide those antioxidants to protect your body from inflammation and stress over time. So keep that in mind. When you look at your plate, is it a rainbow? And I don't mean a candy rainbow. I mean lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of colors, blueberries, carrots, things that your body is craving and need to protect itself from those damaging effects of stress. The other thing is make sure you're following up on dental appointments because when there's tooth decay, you're getting bacteria in your bloodstream that will find its way to your heart and create more stress for your heart than it needs. It's already going through enough. Let's keep everything up, you know, uh, clean and, and well taken care of. Um, taking a walk is really important. And I would say taking a walk that involves 20 minutes in nature, and I'll tell you why. Just like good nutrition and hydration, exercise protects your body from the effects of chronic stress exercise just a walk with deep breathing reduces inflammation increases blood flow to your brain promotes healthy blood pressure boosts your memory improves mood supports restful sleep and reduces those stress hormones how many times am i saying that huh it can't be overstated that these things that I'm teaching you today reduce the circulation of stress hormones. When you let them run um, without interference in your body, it creates an inflammatory environment that is going to lead to disease. When you actively take steps to reduce those stress hormones, you're protecting your body, you're protecting your emotional health. Now, yes, I've got a beautiful picture that looks like, wow, well, you know, if I was in the Pacific Northwest, I could do that. Here we are in Southern California, and a lot of us don't have access to something that beautiful. But what I'm talking about with nature could be as simple as your backyard patio. It could be as simple as getting some bird seed and making sure there's one or two birds in your backyard that can sing. It can be as simple as getting peanuts and getting one squirrel to visit you on a regular basis. So it's not the size of the nature, it's nature coming to you. You can put plants in your backyard, just spend time with green, you know, flowers, animals, things that remind you that, um, that kind of get your feet back on the earth. So that leads us to the fifth strategy. Remember when I said, gosh, Dementia, what could be positive about dementia? Well, here comes something even deeper, which is the meaning and the purpose. Those who find a clear sense of purpose find it much easier to spring back from adversity. Why is that? Because it's more important to find why you're in this than what. Instead of looking at the circumstances, look at the purpose and meaning through that circumstance. Having a purpose gives us energy to meet our demand and gives us the energy and the wherewithal and the will to get through it to the other side. So 
what strengthens meaning and purpose, especially when it's really hard to see um, the light at the end of the horizon or the proverbial spring in the middle of a desert, right? Um, couple of things. One is the expression of gratitude. For whatever reason, expression of gratitude or that's buried in the dirt <laughs> can give us a sense of there's meaning, there's order, it makes sense. Um, I'm not in this um, as kind of a random act. This there's it's purposeful. And so you look for things that are positive. You look for things to be great, gra grateful for, and you express that gratitude to others. So the more that you're finding things to thank people for, however small, believe me, it comes full circle. People are then thanking you. They're coming out of the woodwork. Um, you you have experiences in your life that seem like something that you couldn't have imagined before. And it gives you a sense of community. So that expression of gratitude is very, very important. The second thing is identifying a purpose that brings you passion and joy. So you can learn to identify who you are in this circumstance, that you are somebody that is responsible for bringing joy to somebody else, that you are there to bring happiness and uh, to minimize anxiety and pain for somebody else. That's a huge purpose. The third thing, immerse, immersely imagine the outcome. Viktor Frankl uh, is quoted as um, giving us this wonderful quote. And uh, as you, some of you know, Viktor Frankl uh, was in four different concentration camps over the course of three years. One of them was Auschwitz. And he um, himself uh, developed this concept of meaning uh, through suffering. And if you haven't read his book, it's quite wonderful and will give you a sense of meaning and purpose in itself. But he um, got through his circumstances with two things, imagining his wife's face and then also imagining this manuscript that he intended to write. Um, this desire to live and to continue to march forward despite what was going on around him and not look too hard to the right or to the left, but to just stay focused. And that's what he means. Use your imagination to get you through. How are we going to do this? Well, I'm going to suggest go on those walks, take your deep breathing, you know, take in that air and listen to your heart. Listen to the deepest heart's desire. Which, can, which you can harness through meditation, prayer, guided imagery, but listen to what you already know inside of you that's gonna create that meaning and purpose. So finally, the sixth strategy, and that is recruiting your team or your posse. The American Psychological Association is very clear that isolation can trigger the flight fight response. It lowers your immunity, it increases inflammation, it increases negative thoughts. Why is that? Because you're left with your own brain. You know, you're thinking about things and thinking about them and ruminating about them. So isolation is not a good thing. So you're you're thinking, well, great. Uh, we're in the middle of COVID and I can't leave my, my loved one alone. And I understand that because as their world gets so, uh, smaller, so does ours, right? but somehow you're going to have to figure out a creative way to break that isolation. And that might be as simple as doing what you're doing now, that you're in the middle of a community. Yes, it's webinar, it's not face-to-face, -face, but you're being creative about how to get other people's voices into your own head. And you can take some breaks. You can call one of your teammates to come in and relieve you if only for an hour but whatever you can do to break that isolation. So I'm gonna recap. Because it's so isolated, it's important that you talk with other people. And the most helpful thing is to talk to like-minded people. And I would say caregivers who understand exactly what you're going through. You don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to defend your stance. People who can say, I got it, I, I, I'm there. Schedule some respite care, take some time away, if only for a few hours. Number three, get educated. Education truly is power. 
Information gives you guideposts, enhance your sense of control, and lowers your anxiety. And you know what that's about. That will lower your stress hormones, right? The, the fourth point is feed your spirit. Do things you enjoy. Even in isolation, do things you enjoy. Turn on the radio. Turn on podcasts. Things that bring you joy. And the final point, build a team. You don't have to do this alone. You've got people even here at Alzheimer's Orange County who are would love to share this journey with you and walk alongside of you. So that's it. Thank you so, so much for your participation. And we've just got some time for a few questions before, um, before we go to our next speaker. Absolutely. If anyone has any questions, please type them in. We do have a few minutes here, about five, maybe 10 minutes. Um, if Until we have questions, I have a few questions for you, Dr. Sure. Linda. Let's try it. Um, we're both longtime caregivers. You cared for your dad. I cared for my mom for almost the same amount of time, like nine years. I think yours was similar, right? Um, yeah. What do you wish you knew as a brand new caregiver? Kind of struggling to figure it out. What, what, would, what do you wish someone would have told you back then? That's a very good point. I think um, one of the things that comes to mind is how challenging that acceptance of the diagnosis was. Um, and when I talked about the stages of grief, I know them well because I went through all of them. And I'm talking to somebody who has studied this, um, who's had experience with it. But when it comes to your own loved one, there's, there's a phenomenon that happens that's very normal and natural and it's hoping that it's not as bad as everybody else's, right? That, that it'll just level out, um, that maybe the blueberries will actually work, um, maybe the fish oil will work, and it's um, a painful moment in time to realize this is going, this is, you know, tomorrow is not the same as today. And what I mastered today is not the same as what I mastered yesterday. So I think going back to your question, the thing that would have really helped is to understand this is a long journey ahead. You don't have to go through it alone and you don't have to have all the answers because the answers that worked yesterday are not gonna necessarily work uh, today. And what works for one person is not gonna necessarily work for another person. And there's magic in groups, there's magic in a team. So I think if somebody had told me that, that it's a long journey ahead, don't sprint, you know, pace yourself and surround yourself with like-minded people. What about you, Melissa? Do you feel like there's something you wish somebody had told you? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, I, so before I worked for Alzheimer's Orange County, I uh, volunteered and I took a class a couple years after my mom started to show signs of early onset Alzheimer's disease. A neighbor, friend of ours, recommended we take a class through Alzheimer's Orange County. And, and that was the best thing somebody did for me because it started me on the path to learning about the disease, learning about what I could do. Um, and, and I took many classes and somebody actually asked and said, this is my first webinar. It's excellent. What other resources Yay! do you recommend? So that's a kind of a perfect tie in. I recommend all of our classes. Um, yes. you, know, you can start with one a month or whatever you have time for. I recommend joining a support group. There's, you know, we have all our support groups virtually right now through for because of COVID. Um, but once, you know, we're able to gather safely again in person, we have support groups all over Orange County. And this can be really helpful. And it's helpful for you as a caregiver to share what's worked for you too, not only to get information, but to offer it to others. Yes. And I think that's such an important part of, of getting together and sharing information. Um, I want to read a couple other comments here. We're getting some some questions. Someone said a comment on music. Um, listening didn't work for my loved one who was an amateur musician, but getting involved in a virtual singing group has been a terrific find. Yes. So that's awesome. Yes. I, I you know that, that um, the capacity for singing um, can surpass even um, you know expressive language. So it's interesting, and you might have found this. The person that asked that question. Um, you might find that the person has trouble formulating what they want to say, but boy, do they remember the words to a song. And even if they don't, they can sing, they can hum along, they can whistle along. My father was whistling long after he lost the capacity to put um, his thoughts into words. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. 
Awesome. Um, another one, another question here. Um, well, someone's asking about our classes. How can we get them? How much are they? Good news. They're all free. Yay, um, and yes, they're available they on our website. If you go to alzoc.org and you can find our education, all of our classes are on there. We also do, as I mentioned, some Facebook live classes on mm -hmm. some Tuesdays. If you go to Facebook slash alzoc, um, you can like us and sign up for notifications to get notified when we go live. We also do those in Spanish on some Mondays. So we have a lot on Facebook and, and our website, I would recommend definitely checking out and you can sign up for Zoom classes or you can tune into Facebook classes. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. asking about that. Um, another question, uh, so thank you for this presentation. How do you navigate relatives that are in denial or not mm -hmm. wanting to deal with the diagnosis? I'm a granddaughter. Mm -hmm that is a main caregiver and the children are not as involved. Do you wanna tackle that one, Dr. G? Yes, um, that actually is a very true phenomenon with families and you know, the way that, um, first of all, talk about adjusting attitudes, we just need to recognize that not everybody copes with stress the same. So some people um, have a low tolerance for stressful events and their way of coping with it is just um, to take it in very small doses, which means a lot of denial, not wanting to see what really is there. The challenge is without information and without exposure, sometimes those people in denial can be uh, obstructive to your efforts to help your loved one. Like they will try to talk you out of what you're doing because mom is just fine, um, where you're trying to explain to them, no, she's not. I would suggest um, considering our classes that we present, we have a lot of handouts that you can distribute to family members that are not necessarily gonna wanna take the classes. Because as I mentioned before, the more information you have, the more your own stress hormones are gonna go down. And so when you've got loved ones who are, it's all they can manage to just, you know, um, check in with you five minutes and say, how's grandma doing? No, she, okay, I, that's all I wanna know maybe they need more information so that they can be more tolerant of something that is so stressful to them. So we do have those handouts. You can post them on your refrigerator. I think we even have handouts that are all written on one page about kind of like everything you need to know about communicating with your loved one and things like that. So um, just wonderful resources at Alzheimer's Orange County. And we've got a helpline um, that you can call as well, but definitely avail yourself of these webinars and. Um, and uh, just understand that everybody copes with stress differently, unfortunately. It's a, it's a pretty um, universal phenomenon for families to kind of get divided about this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, denial is so tricky and everyone kind of has to take their own time to get there, unfortunately, um, as much as we want to rush them into you know, a place. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, you know, if you're not the primary caregiver, you don't see what the primary yeah. caregiver is seeing you're not living with the person you're not seeing the same thing and so um if anyone's out there that is kind of a more distant family member or friend believe the primary caregiver um you know yes. give them the benefit of the doubt and and say you know how can i learn what can i do and and yes we have tons of handouts on our website as well as the mm -hmm. classes that family and friends are welcome to attend um one comment i like says in addition to laughter tears are good <laughs> yes of course yeah. we, need that. <laughs> we need tears too um you can uh, do both at once. Says, <laughs> a lot of times we do. <laughs> I do at least. Um, yes. This says, I'm a part of the posse for my best friend who has Alzheimer's. Yay. Her caregivers <laughs> also overwhelmed. We love best friends as part of the posse. Yes. Um, her partner slash caregiver is overwhelmed. Any tips for me to get her to a support group? Um, support group is kind of low on the list of priorities. What are some advantages I can use to encourage her to go? I talked a little bit about the advantages of just sharing and being a part mm -hmm. of the group. Anything else you want to add to the support group benefits? Oh, it's, it's definitely important. And I'm glad you're pointing that out. I think um, one of the, the benefits of COVID is that we're coming to you instead of you coming to us. So the friend of yours that's having trouble um, either reconciling in her own mind or trying to find the space and time to attend in person can have access to a lot of these webinars and feel very supported. Um, because just as we're doing today, we're sharing chats, we're talking, we're having a conversation and she's going to feel less alone. Um, so maybe you could, you know, bring your iPad over and put a face mask on and 
and um, you know, exposure to some of the people here at Alzheimer's Orange County who could be her support. We also have a, um, you know, that that helpline that I mentioned before. So there's some creative ways to get us to her instead of her coming to us. So um, the email address that you shared, Melissa, maybe you can share it again. The yeah. Uh, the one that yeah, um, they can ask questions of you and you can give them specific phone numbers and contact information. Can you repeat that? Yeah, our you can email learn, L-E-A-R-N, at alzoc.org. You can call our helpline, 844-373-4400. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Galindo. Uh, I want to turn welcome. it over to Dr. Trin so that we stay on time. But this last kind of question I want to address here is um, what helps you stay uh to calm down instantly and you always talk about deep breathing and that yes the, the breathing the navy seals use you know take a yes. deep breath in for a count of four hold it for yep. a count of four, hold it for a count of four release it yeah. for the count of four and listen was i sitting on a yoga mat doing this no i was not i was walking to my car and back and what i would do though is i would slow my pace down to a march because I wanted my pace to match what my ideal heart rate would be. So I wasn't jogging to my car. I was, you know, it was a march and I would breathe in, breathe out um, and fill that lung capacity, hold it on the count of four, release it through your mouth on the count of four. I promise you it will trick your brain into believing it's in a relaxed state rather than a flight fight uh, mode. So that's the, that's the quickest way you can do it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Dr. Galindo. And okay. now we're going to switch gears here. Hello, Mr. Dr. Trin. How are you? Thanks for being here. Uh, are you muted? Oh, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, let me introduce you real quick. Most of these folks with us probably don't need me to introduce you because you're such a you know standard figure around here. But Dr. Trin is the Chief Medical Officer at Irvine Clinical Research. He's a board member at Alzheimer's Orange County. He's a physician with Memorial Care. He's on the front lines of COVID. He's working in the ER. Um, he's also a medical missionary with Tongue Out Medical Missions. He's also a Zoom expert, a wizard. He does everything. <laughs> he gives uh, lots of talks around Orange County on, on various subjects. And so we asked him to come here today to talk a little bit about kind of evidence-based medicine, dementia care, you know, what's on the horizon with research? What should we be doing in the meantime before we have a cure for Alzheimer's? And so please type in your questions at any time. He can see them all um, and he'll try to get to as many as he can in the next 30 minutes or so. Um, but if I could start you off and just ask a quick question that came from one of our um, caregiver conference uh, planning committee members is, you know, we see so many products on the market that claim to boost brain health, claim to prevent dementia, you know, how do we sort out those claims that we see on TV from, from the real stuff, what we can actually do? I know that's kind of a big question, but maybe you can just start us off talking about, you know, what's, what's the real deal? What's really out there? Um, what can we actually do in the meantime um, to help reduce our risk for cognitive decline as much as possible? And so I'm going to shoot you that one. I'm going to go away um, and I'm just going to let you take over for the next 25 minutes or so. Um, so take it away, Dr. Trin. Very cool. All right. Can uh, so, guys, uh, welcome. Uh, good to see everyone, at least virtually here. I can see your questions on the uh, under the chat. Uh, type in something uh, under the chat box, just just so I can know that I can see your questions. Like type yes or something like that. Um, so that as the questions come in, I can see you guys uh, with that. So anyway, what I want to do during this time is talk about something really important. It's called evidence-based uh, medicine. And, and I don't know if you've heard of that term before with, uh, with evidence-based medicine, but it's a term that's really important to know because it helps us sort out good science versus good marketing. Right. And and so how do you know if somebody's just trying to sell you a product? And is there really any science or, or truth behind those products? Uh, so I want to attempt to uh, at least give you some some guidelines on how to sort all that stuff out. Uh, my first question to you is what is evidence based medicine 
uh, you know, what is evidence-based medicine and uh, how do you define it? What's the definition of it? And to me, evidence-based medicine simply means that the scientific process has been rigorously, you know, rigorously um, evaluated on a product or on a claim, right? Like, how do you know if vitamin B12 is is good for your brain or or fish oil or product A versus product, you know, B? How do you know if hydroxychloroquine works for COVID? Um, is there evidence behind it, especially with this pandemic? I've seen so many claims of of this and that, and uh, and a number of uh, different things being promoted. Is there data behind that? And so, let me see here. I want to take a look and see if I can see the dashboard and uh, audio. Do you want to share your screen? Yeah, how do I share my screen? Let uh, me make you the presenter, one second. Okay, okay. Well, no, I don't have to share my screen. I just wanna see the questions that come in. Okay, cool, all right. I see questions here. All right, I'm good. And good, good, good. Okay, I can see questions that come in. So that's the, the most important thing here. I'm gonna make the questions box really big here. So I can see that. And, and the first thing I want to share with you is, is how we get to the evidence. What do we do to get to the information and the science behind a medication or a product to know whether it works or, or whether it doesn't work, right? And, and in science, we do what's called clinical trials. Have you guys heard of clinical trials before? Does that ring a bell? Type in yes or something if you, if you heard of that before. Uh, and so I am deeply in clinical trials because I'm the uh, chief medical officer for a, a clinical trials organization. And, and so we do clinical trials specific to, to Alzheimer's and dementia and memory loss and things of that sort. Uh, and so what a clinical trial is, it's really, it's a process to evaluate uh, a, a product, a medication, uh, or things of that sort. And the way we do that is we put groups of patients to, if, to test out these medications or products. And there are many types of clinical trials. There are clinical trials that are called double-blind clinical trials. There are clinical trials that are observational clinical trials. Right, um, and there are clinical trials that are prospective, where we look forward in time with these medications to see if they work or they don't work. And then there are clinical trials that are considered retrospective, where we look back in time uh, at the at the medical records and the charts and the data to see, you know, in the past if this may have worked or not worked. And the phase and clinical trials come in various phases. And the purpose of many clinical trials is to determine whether something works or whether it doesn't work, right? Does this product work? Does this medication work? And did you know that from the time a medication is thought of in somebody's brain, right? In some scientist's brain, to the time that the FDA approves a medication, assuming that it works, is usually 10 to 12 years. 10 to 12 years from somebody's brain to the FDA saying, yes, it works, it can now be prescribed, right, as a medication. 10 to 12 years, guys, is how long this process takes. And this process goes in phases. Uh, initially, you have what's called the preclinical phase. The preclinical phase is a phase that where we test the products on animals, on uh, you know mouse, mice, rats, monkeys. So it doesn't apply really to to people, right? Although some can say that you know some men are rats, but other than that, you know it doesn't really apply to people. It's uh, in animals is what we we test 
these products first, and that's the preclinical phase. And if it looked, you know, somewhat successful in the preclinical phase, that's when we take it to human trials, where we evaluate these medications, products, supplements in, in people. And, and these human trials go in phases. We have phase one, phase two, phase three, and, and let me tell you what these phases are about. Phase one, phase one clinical trials is when we evaluate the product, you know, the medication, the supplement, the vitamin, whatever it is, we evaluate it in healthy people, in completely healthy people. And Maureen says some men are rats. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Never mind. So, so in phase one, we evaluate in human, in, in healthy folks, with the one objective to to look at safety, to look at safety first. Right. We want to make sure that in the first phase of any clinical trial that these medications are overall safe. Right? We don't want anyone to you know, grow a third eye, a tail, drop dead. That's phase one, right? Is it safe? And if it's safe, then we move to phase two. We move to phase two. And in phase two, we continue to check for safety. We always do that in, in any phase. But in phase two, oftentimes what we do is we look at the different dosing, right? So for this medication, um, is it what works best? Is it a 10 milligram dose? Is it a 100 milligram dose? Is it a thousand milligram dose, right? What works best? What dose works best for what we're trying to achieve? And, and so we look at that often in phase two, different dosing, uh, different pathways, right? We call them different arms of the study. So one arm may be a 50 milligram dose. The second arm may be the 100 milligram dose and we evaluate for dosing. Uh, that's what we typically do for phase two, okay? Is everyone following me so far? If you are, type in yes. Type in yes if you're following me so far. I, I, don't, I wanna make sure I haven't lost anybody, right? With all this uh, mumble jumble science here. That, uh, okay, good, good. You guys are following me, excellent. So that's phase two, is looking at different dosing, looking at the best dose that may have the best effects, right? And again, we continue to look for side effects and, and things of that sort. How do we monitor side effects? Well, we can do blood work to look at your liver function, your kidney function. We can do, you know, uh, we can ask you what side effects you've had. Did you get a rash from it? Did you get any weird symptoms from it? And things of that sort. So that's phase two. And, and if phase two looks successful, meaning what that means is, you know, it reaches a, a primary endpoint. And that endpoint may be, you know, this is effective. We want to measure this. Uh, this is the metrics we're looking after to see if this medication work. And, and by the way, we found out in phase two that maybe this dose works better than that dose, right? If, if I'm trying out three doses in phase two, it may tell me which dose works the best. So if if the medication goes through phase two successfully and it hasn't failed by then, right? And then we move to phase three. Phase three is when we test the medication in, in hundreds and thousands of patients, right? We, we figure out the dose that we like, we figure out the dose that may work the best and we apply that to thousands of patients. And often with these medications, uh, in, in these phases, right, we, we break down the categories into groups that are taking the real medication and groups that are taking a placebo, right, a placebo, like kind of like a sugar pill, right, to, and then we compare both groups to see what works better, uh, the placebo versus the real thing. Now, uh, Donna says, is there a specific time between each phase? Yes, yes. Uh, on average, each phase, I would say, will take two to three years. Each phase takes about two to three years, which is why you go through three phases and it's almost 10 years, right? And then you spend some time to analyze the data, and which is why it takes 10 to 12 years to get something approved. Uh, 
with that. That's a generalization, two to three years. And so, and so it, in these medications, it is very important when we do our clinical trials, guys, that these studies to evaluate the effectiveness of a medication, that we always have a, a group that is taking the placebo, right? We always have a, a group that's taking the placebo. And the question is, you know, isn't that kind of unfair if you're taking a placebo, you know, you don't get the benefit of the medication? Well, it's important because we need to compare both groups to see if there's a true effect between the group taking the real medication versus the placebo group. Why is that important? Here's why. Let me give you a COVID example, right? That we're all living through right now, a COVID example. If I came out and I told you that, uh, you know, I, I got the miracle cure for COVID, I've tried it on, uh, you know, on 3,000 patients and and they all who got COVID and they all got better, right? They all got better. My 3,000 patients that I've tried, my miracle cure. Let me see if I can find a miracle cure somewhere here. Okay, right. So this is my miracle cure for COVID. I've tried it on all my patients. I'm now on YouTube promoting this, right? And I'm and I've got testimonials. I've got testimonials because this patient said she was cured. That patient said he was cured from COVID from my miracle cure pill, which is, you know, I'm only offering a discount today. If you're buying it today on my uh, Go, Go webinar uh, episode today, right? 50% off. How do you know if that works or not? How do you know if my miracle COVID cure works or not? Any idea, guys? Right? Any ideas if it's uh, going to work or not? And and so the importance is this. If you have evidence-based medicine, and this is talking about evidence-based medicine, the evidence is determined by the clinical trials. The clinical trials tell you if there's evidence behind that, right? That's to address Kathleen's question. Is, is it talking about, you know, are we talking about only clinical trials? Clinical trials determines evidence. Without the clinical trials, you don't have the evidence. Does that make sense to you guys? Without the clinical trials, we do not have the evidence. Um, so let me know if that makes sense to you. Uh, yes or no uh, with that. Without comparing a medication with a placebo group, you don't know if this medication truly works. Why is this important? specifically to to all these promotions of of covid right uh cures that we are hearing this is why it's important to do these clinical studies because if covid survival is 99% right if if only 1% of folks who get covid die from covid and 99% of us live i can literally go out there and tell you that I've tried it in all my patients, and the majority of them, of them survive. The majority of them survive. If you didn't know that there was a clinical trial behind that or not, how would you know that this pill works because of the pill? Or how would you know if the pill doesn't really work because 99% of people survived anyway with or without the pill? This is why it is so important to have evidence behind, right, behind what's being promoted. And the evidence is done through the research, through the clinical trials. Does that make sense to you guys so far? Does that make sense to you guys so far, right? Otherwise, anyone can promote anything, throw up a few testimonials of folks who say it worked for me right and and sell your stuff and and this is deeply important uh to me because because i've seen so much stuff going around in the pandemic and i know that a lot of stuff does not work uh because you can claim this you can claim that my first question 
is, is there research? So Kathleen says, right, how does a lay person have access to, to clinical trials information? Great question. Great question. So, so if somebody's going to promote a product, the first question you ask is, I would like to see the research behind the product. I would like to see the data that has been published in a medical journal. If they don't have data on their product in a medical journal that's peer reviewed by other physicians and scientists, I can tell you that they simply don't have data, <laughs> right? The data needs to be published. And, and so you could probably Google a lot of that uh, as far as, you know, research behind product A. The research you want to look for, the research that counts is research that are double blind, meaning there's a placebo group. Remember the importance of a placebo group is because you need to compare the real thing with a placebo group. Because if the placebo group has a 99% survival rate, which is what COVID is, right? COVID is 99% survival, and your product has 99% survival, then your product is no different than placebo, which means your product is no different than, than drinking orange juice, right? If I had all my patients with COVID go out and drink orange juice and they all survive, I can claim that orange juice cured you, right? That's why we need that placebo group to, to determine that, uh, that difference uh, with that. Now, there are three ways that the evidence can, can be interpreted. There are three ways that the evidence can be uh, interpreted. Number one, when you are reviewing a, a you know, double-blind clinical trial, there are either clinical trials that show that it works, right? Double-blind clinical trials that show that it has a positive effect. It works. So, so that is a product that is evidence-based evidence supported a clinical trial double blinded on a product that shows that this medication was actually effective compared to a placebo group okay when we talk about evidence based it means there are double blind clinical trials as that's the evidence and it showed it worked that's option number one option number two is this the clinical trial shows that the evidence does not work the clinical trial shows that the evidence does not work. And so, so it's either going to work or it's not going to work. Does that make sense to you guys so far? It's either, if they have clinical trials on the product, you know, double blind clinical trial, it's either going to work or not work. It's simple. Does it work? Did, did it meet its primary endpoint, right? Its primary goal showing that it worked or did it, not work it's it's that straightforward option number three option number three is where most claims fall in right? most claims actually fall under option number three option number three is this there isn't any evidence because the studies have not been done right there's not sufficient data to to make a decision on this product there's not sufficient data to make a decision on this product now, not sufficient data does not mean that it doesn't work. Not sufficient data does not mean that it doesn't work. Not sufficient data doesn't mean that it does work either. It just means we don't have enough information, right? The studies, the phase three studies have not been done. There's insufficient data. And, and so many products fall under that category. Uh, with that. So can I address some supplements that may be helpful? Yes. Do you want to hear about supplements that may be helpful for the brain <laughs> with some data behind it? The, so what I can tell you, if you're thinking about supplements that have been studied and published, I can tell you that first of all, rather than looking at supplements, look at nutrition. I always believe and I always promote that your diet should be your medicine. And guess what, guys? There are diets that have gone through these studies. 
there are diets that have gone through these studies. It's uh, one is called the Mind Diet. M I N D. Look at the Mind Diet. It is a combination of the Mediterranean diet along with the Dash diet, and that diet has been published several times in different journals, showing that it reduces the risk for Alzheimer's. Isn't that crazy that there's a diet behind that? Um, so I would suggest that you look that up. Really good stuff uh, with that. Uh, Kathy says, are there any new drugs to slow the progress of dementia? Yes, yes, there are drugs uh, currently being done. There are actually drugs in our office that have been on the, the Wall Street Journal uh, in the last few weeks, uh, right in our office at Irvine Clinical Research, that has gone through and got positive phase two results. Uh, phase two results were positive, showing these are drugs, these are our, our monoclonal antibodies, uh, IV infusions that are designed to target the Alzheimer's plaque in your brain. So I, I think most of you guys have heard about the Alzheimer's plaque, right, that is up here. So there are medications that uh, target the plaque, remove the plaque, and shows compared to a group on the placebo group, right, it shows a less of a decline in memory loss compared to, to the placebo group. So yes, uh, there are drugs that are in the pipeline that uh, that is showing that result uh, with that. Um, let me see here. Uh, let me see some other questions here. What would the ratio be being considered? I'm not sure what that means, Maureen. Supplements are not FDA approved, so is that misleading? Yes, so the supplements need to have their phase one, two, and three clinical trials in it for us to really know if it's effective or not. Not all supplements, many supplements are not FDA approved, but the question you want to ask is, is there data behind the supplements? Is there data behind the supplements? How many of you guys have heard of Prevagen? The, uh, is it the jellyfish? How many of you guys have heard about Prevagen before? Anyone heard of that? Um, I think they market that all the time for, for the brain. So let me teach you a little bit about marketing versus science, right? So Prevagen is a product that's on TV. It's a product that's being marketed uh, on TV for brain health. And, and what they did was they said, you know, it, we have data that shows that Prevagen works. And, and they are right partially. And I'll tell you why that is. Prevagen's phase two data shows that uh, it works, right? Prevagen's phase two data shows effectiveness in, you know, in, in these memory tests and these things that, that are done. In phase two, in phase two, when Prevagen went to phase three and they tested a whole bunch more patients, right? When Prevagen went to phase three, they failed their primary endpoint, meaning it was no different than placebo. Think about it, guys, think about that. When they went to phase three and they tested a lot more patients, their, they did not meet their primary endpoint. It was no different than placebo. So is this medication, is this supplement an evidence-based right, supplement or not? And, and if you look at phase three, the answer is no. The answer is no. But what you see on TV is what they publish for phase two, because phase two worked. And they will tell you phase two works. Uh, well, they'll just tell you it worked. But but what you don't know is they took it to phase three and it did not work. This is why evidence-based medicine is so important, guys, that, that you know the difference and you know how to interpret these things. Uh, so, so my goal today, and you know, we can spend like a whole hour on this. My goal today is to kind of give you the, the framework on how to think about these things when somebody is promoting a product uh and and things of that sort right and uh and the framework is yes there's evidence they did double blind clinical trials and it was effective 
No, there's evidence that they did double blind clinical trial and it was not effective. Or three, we don't have enough information. The, the, the trials are not done. So it's one of the three is how you interpret that when you look at it. All right. That's a perfect place for us to transition. Thank you so much, Dr. Trin. How, we have a ton of questions that we obviously didn't have time for. How can people get in touch with you? And I, you could say it and then I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, they, but how should people reach out to you? Feel free to shoot me an email. It's my AlzoC email. It's uh, dung.trin at alzoc.org. And, and I'm gonna I, put that in the chat right now. Well, and just, yes, please reach out and, and I'll, I'll forward you some of the other questions too so that you can reach out to some of these folks. Thank you so much. Um, we are moving right along and I'm gonna invite our next uh, presenters here to, to turn on their webcams and join us, Danny and Janetta. Um, this is a segment I'm so excited about. Uh, we have our friends here, hello, and I'm gonna uh, allow you to share your screen, Danny, so that you can put that up as I'm introducing you guys. Okay. Uh, so yeah. go for it. We'll try to do the slides. Uh, so this is a writer, comedian, Danny. She's the founder and CEO of Laughter on Call. And just like many of us, she's a caregiver. Um, she started Laughter on Call after her mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And, and you know, she kind of thought, well, it takes a lot of courage to be a caregiver. It takes a lot of courage to be a comedian. Why not mix the two worlds? And um, she can tell you more about it, but it's been a really amazing for so many caregivers, so many people living with dementia. Um, laughter is so key, as Dr. Galindo talked about this morning. She's been performing uh, comedy for over 20 years. She's taught stand-up comedy. Um, she comes to us from, from a huge comedy background, and she's also joined by her uh, colleague, Janetta. Welcome, Janetta. Um, so because we're, we're so tight on time, and we can go a little bit past 1130, but I want to turn it over to you, and then when, we, when you need me, just call out, Danny, and, and I'll be on standby. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Hey, everybody. Hi. Webcam world. <laughs> Hi. Um, hey, so yeah, we're going to lighten it up a little bit. And it's so true what was just said about um, coming up with this whole idea because of the courage that uh, when you're a comedian, I'll just start there. When you're a comedian, people always say to you, oh, stand-up comedy, that's the hardest thing. I could never do that. That's the hardest thing. And then uh, when my mother was struggling with uh, Alzheimer's and I witnessed what caregivers do every day and the amount of courage that that takes to keep showing up, I was like, wait a minute, this is a crazy amount of courage. And maybe these courageous comedians could maybe transfer their skills and help people. And so that's how we started Laughter on Call. Um, so we don't have a lot of time together. So what I want to do is just give you some great tips because, uh, because I so value what you do. And it's interesting because this used to be just like laughter tips, but then we found out, you know what it really is about? It's about self-care. So you're going to notice that this is really more about you <laughs> and that's how we like it. So, okay. So the first thing I hope you can see, I'm a little bit, uh, yes, we're all good. I'm getting the thumbs up from Janetta. So creating connection through self-care and shared laughter. Great. And now let me, okay. Janetta, can you read that for us, please? You bet. All right. Burdens of today's caregivers have actually increased from what they were a century ago. They include round the clock, concierge, chauffeur, schedule manager, medication and technology troubleshooter, in addition to cook, maid, attendant, not to mention income earner. Yes. And that is taken from Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal. If you don't have that, if you haven't heard of it, it's a wonderful book. Uh, but what I love about it is it really nails, I hope some of you are nodding your head through that. Like it really nails how extensive <clears throat> and all encompassing being a caregiver is and the challenges of it, which is why you can understand why we need some comic relief. Yes. All righty. Now, here's the thing about laughter is good for you. Stress hormones, feelings of isolation, tension and pain go. <laughs> down, and facial muscles, endorphins, oxygen to lungs, human connection, up. Yes, and it burns calories. I know, laughing burns calories, because that's what you care about when you're in a pandemic and being a caregiver, right? Okay, what's really cool is recently, 
Uh, it feels like the rest of the world has caught up with us because this was just in the New York Times. Doctors, nurses, and therapists have a prescription for helping all of us to get through these difficult times. Try a little laughter. Yes. So uh, it does appear that everyone recognizes now the health benefits and the need for connection that laughter uh, creates. And of course, this is what we found working with Alzheimer's patients was how much you could really create feelings of trust and connection through just a moment of shared laughter. So I'm gonna go through um, four out of the eight tools that I usually talk about because we're on limited time, but I wanna just give you a taste, right? So first, we're gonna talk about B, B is for breathe. So I know this sounds really obvious because we would just breathe whether I told you to or not, but conscious breathing is such a great tool for caregiving. It's, I always refer to it as like the first building block of self-care. Like it's that first moment of, you know what, I matter and I'm just gonna take a conscious breath here. And what's also great about that is that it gives you pause. It just gives you pause in a highly stressful situation to just take a beat. And that is a great gift. And of course, it contributes to your patience because you've taken a pause. So I really want to, because we have Janetta here, I would love to, we're just gonna do some, a couple of breathing exercises together. So um, Janetta, do you wanna take it away? <clears throat> Maybe I'll breathe through my, my frog in my throat. <laughs> yes, I will absolutely do that. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Janetta. I am the Director of Operations at Laughter on Call and also a comedian. And I'd love to walk you through a little warm up that we do, not only for ourselves, for caregivers, for our seniors, for whoever, it's for anyone really. And if you would like to, I would love for you to get on your feet and stand up in your home, but if you can't, that's totally fine. You can stay seated and just keep your back straight against the chair but I like to get up and really just get on my feet a little bit because I'm constantly in the Zoom world, right? So get your feet firmly planted on the ground, feel yourself supported by the earth. It's like there are roots shooting out of your feet into the ground, really supporting you. If your legs are crossed, uncross your legs, give a little bend to your knee and just really feel yourself supported. We're gonna do some deep breaths in. We're gonna breathe in for three. We're gonna hold for three. And then when we release, I want you to let it all out with your breath and your voice and anything you wanna let out. What do you wanna release into the world? Maybe you have some happiness, some joy, maybe a little anger, frustration, that's fine. Let's let it all out. Let's breathe in and let it out. All right, here we go. Breathe in for three. Nice. And then let it out. I like to really get it out there. Again, breathe in. Great. Let it out. Nice. One more time. Breathe in. Fill up those lungs. And then let it out. Nice. All right. So next, what we're going to do is shake out our arms, shake out our legs. So we're going to count to five with our right, five with our left, five with our right foot, five with our left foot, and then to four, three, two, one. All right. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. 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 One, two, three, four. 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 One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 one. We can't see you, but we hope you're doing it. It feels good. It's amazing. All right. So now let's just kind of roll our head around gently, gently, gently. Listen to your body. Don't push yourself too hard. All right. Go the opposite direction. Rolling it around, rolling it around. Very good. Bring it down to your shoulders. Give your shoulders a little. Nice. And then forward. Very good, and bring it to your hips. Nice, just rocking it around, and then down to your feet. Really just waking up our whole body. All right, so next, gonna reach up to the sky, reach, reach, reach. I like to kinda give a little bend, a little stretch. And I would love you to think about, and if you want, you can shout it out in your home, what you wanna reach for? What do you want out of your day, out of the week, out of the year, out of whatever? So you can shout it out. Maybe Danny, give me one. 
uh, uh, peace, peace, <laughs> health, <laughs> health, joy, laughter, joy, laughter. snacks. I love it. All right, reach it, grab it down, go. Yes. Yes. One more time. Reach. Grab it. Yes. Yes. Nice. All right, take your hands. Just give your face a little massage. Let's give ourselves a little self care, huh? Do so much chatting. Gosh, moving. But I'll move that face around. Very good. And now that your face is relaxed and your jaws relaxed, this is something you can do anytime. Take your hands, put them in front of your face, and shake it like a shake weight. <laughs> awesome. I love it. All right. Now we're going to do a quick tongue twister that we came up with, and it's kind caregiving can cure. <laughs> we came up with this one yesterday, and we love it. Kind yeah. caregiving can cure. So if you can say that five times fast, try to enunciate and just say it five times. Here we go. Kind caregiving can cure. 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 Woo! If you made a mistake, that's fine. We're all human. All right. Give yourselves a round of applause. Pat yourself on the back. Give yourself a squeeze. And I'm going to throw back to Danny. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you, Janetta. No, it's interesting. Oh, my goodness. I literally swallowed a frog this morning, and he is having a party in my throat. Um, about this uh, caregiving and curing and laughter, uh, I recently met with the Harvard, Harvard gerontology people, and they have discovered this uh, interesting statistics that how important it is, the attitude and the, the energy of the caregiver, that in fact, uh, caregivers who are depressed contribute to a 10% quicker decline in the disease. So good to know that it really is vitally important to take care of ourselves and keep our spirits together. So one tool that we love is the, this idea of I being for imperfect, that imperfect is okay and it's better than okay for comedians because we know that's where the humanity is and that's where the fun is gonna be. So uh, one thing that I observed between when my father was ill with cancer and my mother was ill with Alzheimer's is that with cancer, people came until the day before. And uh, with Alzheimer's, it turned out like after six months that people stopped showing up. And one of the reasons that I observed is that people really are afraid and they don't know what to do and they're afraid they're not going to do it right. You know, they don't, they don't want to do it imperfectly. And so that's why we focus so much on you know, just showing up, and you all know that the value of just showing up, how important that is. So why is imperfect okay? Because we relate to it, we identify with the humanity of it, and we find connection from it. So now you have an opportunity, you can ask yourself on a really tense day, you know, am I trying to be perfect here? Am I, am I having this expectation? Am I trying to compensate? This is often with family caregivers, you know, or family members who visit, or they try, they try so hard to make it perfect, you know, and it doesn't need to be perfect. It's a long haul, as we know. So one thing that I found really interesting in terms of the uh, analysis to comedy and caregiving is that as comedians, we always have a routine, right? You have a set list. You're going to do this bit and this bit and this bit. And as a caregiver, you have a routine for the day. You're going to have breakfast, you're going to get changed, go for a walk, take a bath, have lunch, et cetera. You have your day planned. Well, in both cases, you know, then there's what happens. There's what actually occurs in the moment. And so this idea of, of being able to just be flexible and accept the moment exactly as it is right there and be present for that is going to bring everybody more joy, much less tension and expectation. So I do like to focus on that. And one tool um, I'm often asked about, okay, but what's a specific tool to do when things are not uh, going as we anticipate? And one that's really fun, which maybe some of you, I'm sure some of you already do, is to take a photograph and talk about the photograph. And in fact, it doesn't necessarily even have to be the truth. It can just be a great story. You can let your imagination run and talk about the people in a magazine you know, and what they're doing, what they maybe did right before or where they're going. And it's just a way to open up your imagination to connect with someone. 
So that's, you know, and the funnier you can make it, the more absurd and kind of silly, the more uh, opportunity you have for laughter. And the great thing about laughter is it really is contagious. So once you're laughing and you're laughing together, it will grow. Um, okay, so the next tool that really goes hand in hand with this uh, is letting go of the moment before. So this is really important uh, for comedians. Obviously, if you're telling jokes and one of them bombs, you can't be like, well, I'm out. You have to move on and let it go and get on to the next moment. And really, I observed this a lot dealing with my mother because I could be talking to her and she seems upset and distracted and something is going on and I feel terrible and responsible and I walk away maybe to get that pause, to take a breath. Uh, and I and I come back and she's laughing and waving to someone and smiling. And if I had stayed invested in that moment before where I'm rooting and what did I do wrong and why isn't this right and why is it, I would have missed the next moment when she actually found some joy. And, you know, it's mercurial and inexplicable a lot of the time. So just something to keep in mind to let go of the moment before. And one great tool for this, which we're not gonna do right now because we're gonna be sensitive to time, is meditation. If any of you uh, have are interested in any kind of a meditation practice, there are apps for it, Headscape, there's a lot. And it really does train your mind to let go of a thought and let go and let go. So it's a really good tool for self-care. Um, the next tool that we really love uh, is this yes and. And it's the, it comes right from improv, improv comedy. And it's the idea of affirming and saying, yes, I hear you, and adding to whatever is being said, rather than shutting someone down and saying, no, I don't think that's true. And uh, this is particularly helpful in cognitive decline caregiving, because there's really no point, as I'm sure you all know, you don't want to get in the ring and argue with anybody in cognitive decline. So this is just a great tool to remember, to just say yes, and let me, uh, yes, your, your son is coming, let's come over here and get ready. And so it's this idea of uh, saying yes and redirecting. So it affirms that you heard what the person and gives you both an opportunity to contribute to that world. You know, you hear that a lot in Alzheimer's care, like meet them where they are, right? So. Uh, so you go with their ideas and build on them, assuming that, you know, nothing that's going to be dangerous or threatening in any way. Um, but if it's just an idea of the imagination, you might as well just say yes and go further into it. Um, so I am going to say yes, say it, yes. Okay, so this is a pro tip for memory care. Um, it's another acronym that I really like, AIR, pronounced AIR. Uh, and it's acknowledge, engage, and redirect. So with acknowledge, right, that's the yes and. You repeat what they've said to validate it. You can ask for a detail, ask for another detail. Um, you can engage, uh, tell me more. And if they can't, let's say you're, they've said this one sentence, but really their language is limited and they can't really build on it, then you can relate it to yourself and you can talk and engage and keep them present and seen. And then you can redirect. You can have this conversation lead you to an activity or uh, another person. Maybe you want to come and share it with another person. So it's just this idea of acknowledging and redirecting. And so that's the little one to remember air, acknowledge, engage, redirect. So um, the next tool uh, that we really love and that I do want to, I'm just checking the time. Perfect. Okay. So S is for silly. And um, this is something that we very much discovered uh, in, at the late stages of Alzheimer's. When people no longer have language, you actually still can connect with them. And it comes from behavior and from having the courage to be a little bit wacky and unexpected. And uh, this is something that we discovered actually even clinically, this idea of mirroring, mirroring, which is hard to say. But um, even when there's a loss of language, they still will mirror back. So it's super fun to, uh, to try to make a face or, you know, sing and, um, and connect with people in that way. I think it was, it's been a really beautiful tool for us. So let me just uh, list here. Here's a couple of uh, professional ways to be silly. So, right, you can make a funny face. 
You can uh, make a noise. You can dance as we do. We love to dance. Um, you can squish your face around. You could sing, sing any song. It really doesn't matter. We, you know, we did a show once on Titanic Remembrance Day. Yes, that's that's actually in the calendar, in the national calendar. There's Titanic Remembrance Day. And so we went and improvised a whole ship thing. And then uh, we went to the band leader and the band leader played Amazing Grace. The band leader, or I say we, it was all pantomime. Uh, Amazing Grace and a room full of 40 people sang Amazing Grace. People who we didn't even know were conscious lit up and sang Amazing Grace. So singing is a great way to connect. Um, and then, you know, birds, flap your arms, doesn't matter, whatever you want to do, it's fun. So um, I thought, this is great, actually. We could, no one's watching you, right? Because we can't even see you. So here's some music and we'll just take a minute and dance around. What do you say? Not even a whole minute, because I know you don't have a lot of time. Earth, wind, and fire, always good. I can't see if you're dancing, but you'll feel better if you do. All right, I'm gonna move this along. And I'm just going to review a little bit. Here we go. Laughter and social bonding, right? Because that's what we're trying to do all the time with not only with the people with the illness, but actually with families. There's so much isolation around this disease. So we really just want to create connection. Researchers say that their results indicate that the release of endorphins triggered by laughter might have a strong role in social bonding, the pleasurable and calming effects of the endorphin release might signal safety and promote feelings of togetherness. And that's really what we're going for. So we kind of pull out all the stops and we encourage you to, to do the same. Uh, so here we go. You can be imperfect, be silly, make someone laugh, create connection. So that's our message at Laughter On Call. And I'm glad we got to spend even a little bit of time with you. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly, Danny at laughteroncall.com. And I'm going to put on some music and then we'll throw it back. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, I know this was just like a such a small taste of what you guys offer. So do you want to talk for a minute about, you know, what other offerings maybe caregivers might be interested in that you guys have? Virtual yeah, stuff? Or... What I really want to do is get out of this. <laughs> webinar now so i can see you guys because ah there you are i can take over i can take over so that it's uh yes i would be happy to answer questions um excellent that was kind of crazy because i was doing it baby but please yes we if you have time please i'll take any questions i don't know where they would or do you just yeah, want to uh, I, I, I don't see any questions. We have lots of comments. So happy Laughter on Call was featured today. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I wish we had more time for you guys. But so I'll put, um, I think your information is on the handout that's available. I did make your, your slides available. And I will email those out to everyone so that they can take a look as well. Um, but yeah, we definitely encourage you to, to email, to reach out to Laughter on Call. I'm sure if you just type in Laughter on Call in Google, you're probably the first person that comes up, hopefully. So yeah, people can, I mean. I will say this, Melissa, we do staff training. So we do, we take the whole team and we're doing it virtually now as well. We were doing it in person, obviously. So we take everybody from the kitchen in a community, for example, everybody from the kitchen staff to the, you know, people who deliver the mail, everybody to the to people on the floor. We all, everybody comes together and we learn the eight tools and we play games and we have a workshop. So everybody understands the challenges within a community. So that is one option. And then I've actually in COVID been running family workshops where you bring in like 20 family members and everybody gets to learn how to show up in a way that they can feel comfortable with. Because as I said, one of the big challenges, and I know everybody on this call gets it, is 
fit, people are freaked. They just, they don't know what to do. And so if you give them specific tools and say, oh, well, you can do this, this, and this, then they feel more comfortable. So we've been running those on uh, virtually. We do everything virtually. Oh, and the last thing I'll say is we do have lunchtime laughter. It's every day from 12 to 1230. And um, it's no charge. And you can come on if you're a caregiver and you're isolated with your person, you can come on and uh, laugh with us for half an hour. Every day is a, a different comedian and it's interactive and we've had amazing responses do, being able to do this work virtually. Awesome, thank you so much. That sounds like an incredible offering for our families that are on right now. Someone asked if you're local, you're LA based, is that correct? We are LA based, cool. but we're at this point we're international because of right. Zoom, like we're everywhere. So that's not a problem at all, but yes, we are LA based. Awesome. Well, if anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us or reach out to Danny and we'll make sure she gets the message. Thank you, Danny and Janetta, so much for being with us today. Sorry it was such a short time. We wish we could I could listen to you guys all day and participate. Um, and, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Active Care, Arbor, Arbor Palms of Anaheim, Senior Helpers, Family Caregiver Resource Center, Archstone, and Council on Aging. Um, I will email you the handouts if you didn't get a chance to download them, and we really hope this was helpful for you. Please fill out our survey. That'll be emailed to you in about an hour. Thank you, everyone. Take good care, and we'll see you next time.